Okay, for, from Chicago Pinball Expo 2015, this is Dave Beecher. Hey, Dave. How's it going? Uh, good. You're the hardware engineer from um, Fast Pinball. And we're in the booth of uh, Fast Pinball, and there's a whole bunch of custom machines here. Um, and one machine we were looking at, I overheard a conversation you were having about wiring and sort of like proper wiring within custom machines. And I just wonder if you can talk about, as people are building machines, what do they need to think about in terms of wiring and grounding and how stuff is connected and all that sort of thing. So maybe kind of give us a tour. This is the play field. Yeah, this is the play field the way it was uh, wired originally. And uh, it looked like what Chris here was doing is kind of going more the traditional approach where he was putting most of the hardware you know, elsewhere in the cabinet. His happened to be in the bottom of the cabinet. But uh, one of the things you can see is that, you know, we have the big wiring harnesses coming down, like a lot of wire here, a lot of copper. So, you know, one of the bad things about this is it's, uh, you know, it's expensive for one. And when you're trying to diagnose problems, it's, you know, difficult to find out where, you know, all the wires are actually running to, to, to try to find the issues. So, what we're trying to do now is find vacant areas on the board, and unfortunately, you know, there is a lot of wire in the way. But I can see some voids up in here, up in here, boy, a lot of room over here on the sides. So what we want to do next is try to mount some of the fast boards in here and try to do all the local wiring from the various areas of the board to the fast boards. So what that really entails is trying to find all the switches that are driving certain coils and those coil wires, and then bringing them down to wherever the fast board is. In fact, Chris, do you have one uh, board that's free right now? It's not ready to go. Okay. Perfect, that's great. So here's one board, and uh, this is a, a 3208, so that means this has 32 switch inputs and eight drivers. So this is probably a really good choice for the upper play field where there might be a bunch of drop lanes and uh, you know pop bumpers and what have you. So you know probably a good spot would be somewhere like right in here. And so you're holding it. It's okay, like wiring it sort of like flat towards the play field versus standing up. Does it make a difference? Yeah, probably. It depends if you have enough room. It might be nice to have it flat if you have enough room to get to the connectors. But a lot of times, real estate on the bottom of the machine is a little tight. From an electrical standpoint, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference. In this case, I, I would probably mount this one up because we do have the side rails for when the machine's being serviced. So even though it looks like we do have considerable space on the side to put it flat, um, if we set it on a counter or we try to get it near those rails, it's, it's going to interfere. Now, so. You talked about this wire and the disadvantages were it's expensive because you're buying a lot of extra wire, but it's also harder to troubleshoot. Uh, do you have to worry about interference or grounding or like radio frequency stuff or anything like that? Or is it just purely a convenience thing to have the wires sort of going more locally? Well, yes, one issue is, especially with LED lighting or more sensitive areas like controllers you might have or digital signals running along, the, the longer you run wires in parallel with you know, sensitive signals, it's like you will get some coupling between that, so you will get some interference. So um, trying to keep the power wires away from all the LEDs, for instance, like that would be beneficial. Uh, you know, people a lot of times talk about that flicker you see when you hit flippers and whatever. Sometimes it is because of interference, but other times too, it's just because of like, you know, power or ground issues as well. So uh, when you see that flicker, it could be a variety of things, but just trying to eliminate it right from the beginning, do the wiring right, that will, uh, you know, prevent a lot of these issues. Um, how about wiring? Does it matter for um, like gauge of wire, type of wire? You know, I feel like you you can't just go to Amazon and type, I want 16 gauge wire or I want 18 gauge wire because there's different like voltage ratings and, and materials are coded with. Is that something that we need to be concerned about as we're building pinball machines? Absolutely. Do you have an opinion on copper clad aluminum? <laughs> yes. No aluminum anywhere. Yes. It's like <laughs> the copper clad aluminum, you cut it and it's silver? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Stay away from aluminum. Um, yeah, so I mean, probably a you know 16 gauge, 18 gauge wire. A lot of times for the high power stuff is kind of acceptable. Sometimes thin wire can work in your benefit. For instance, like you know, if you do have something you know very high current, having that resistance drop a little bit will kind of take some of the spikes off. You know, for EMI, some things like that can actually help. But you also are getting less current to the coils that you want. So. If, if you do have something that demands a lot of power, like, you know, flippers have always been fairly heavy gauge wire. So there's a lot of, you know, you never would use something thin like, you know, uh, 24 gauge or something to run uh, flippers. And there are wire charts online you can go see for this rated wire can handle this much current, right? And so, typically, so like in, I know traditional Williams machines, it's a thicker wire, it's a heavier gauge for your drivers, but your switches. Yeah, um, switches, especially on ours, you know, 
resistance in the wires, the longer the length, the thinner the diameter, the more resistance it's going to have. So one nice thing about uh, having everything local, like when you are connecting the switches directly to these connectors in really low proximity, you could get away with you know even 28 gauge wire. The problem is at some point the wire is so thin, it's more likely to break just kind of moving it around. So you know probably you know 24 gauge would probably be a really good wire to use for switches, and uh, you know you could you know if you want a little bit more girth on that, you can go a little bit uh, you know. It doesn't hurt you to go with bigger wire it's just more expensive correct yeah correct you know sometimes i prefer a slightly thicker wire because i you know it's the worst thing when you're sitting there moving around and all of a sudden wire breaks oh, dang. and you want to use stranded wire for all this not solid yes, no solid wire on this stranded wire for everything um and then so anything else i mean in terms of of layout so it's just you, you lay the the way the play field is laid out it is what it is and then the wiring conversation is more about once you get everything set how you actually route it on you know on uh, underneath the play field and how you actually sort of bundle the wires together and how you you know sort of make them go where they need to go. Yes, correct. Uh, it's just the the one rule we have with the fast hardware is that the coil, whatever drivers that you have, the switches controlling those drivers, it's beneficial to put on the same board because then you can completely auto fire. If you're more doing it through software, it doesn't matter where things are at. If you're using like the Mission Framework, for instance, and it's you know going to be looking at the switches and firing the coils, it doesn't matter the location that they're in. So this is more um, for the auto fire coil. So if you've got a pop bumper, you want that switch and that coil on the same board. If you have a slingshot, you want that switch and that coil on the same board. Correct. And if you have some strange mode where a flipper button might be controlling a pop bumper, I don't know. I've never seen it yet, but it could be done then it might be beneficial to have that pop bumper on the same driver board that is also featuring the, the flippers. So it can all be hardware controlled instead of going to the host computer and then coming back round trip. Correct, correct. Um, what about grounding? That's something that everyone talks about. There's earth ground versus logic ground, and are they tied together, are they not tied together? What do we need to keep in mind? Or is, that, or is that a separate video? Well, it might be a separate video. I mean, we could talk about it a little bit. Um, you know, and to ground them together or not to ground them together, there's many, there's many questions there, but I mean, the ground is incredibly important because we do have multiple power supplies that their grounds all have to be tied together. If you have one power supply floating and it, you know, it's like you can get some very weird offsets going on between the power supplies. Okay, so when you say power supply floating, what's that mean? Well, it means like it's that ground is not tied to the ground of another power supply. So in other words, if you had a 5 volt, a 12 volt, you know, a 48 volt power supply, it's really important that all three of those be grounded together. They will not work if they're not. It, there's no common ground for them all to work. But even worse, if you have one floating and it be, can become in contact with something else, like a ground is missing, or all of a sudden the machine was running and you hook that back up, sometimes you get some really weird currents going through the machine when it all tries to get to the same potential and can cause some real issues. So, you know, run multiple, keep them together. You know, it, it's like, don't all of a sudden take all your grounds to one point and then go down your power supplies and just have one little thin wire because that thing is going to be moving around. It's acting like a ground, but it's not a stiff ground, so you could definitely have a lot of problems there. All right, so let's do, we'll do a different video on grounds because we have to talk about ground straps and ground braids and all this kind of stuff. Absolutely, yeah. um, What about mounting the hardware? So, you know, the driver boards, we can put them ideally underneath the play field, near in the general area of, of where, they, where they're controlling things. Um, the main control boards, does it matter whether they're, they're up in the back box or on the, on the bottom? Does it make a difference kind of where that is? You can put them in multiple spots. The big difference really is on, on your lighting and how far you want those wires to be. Um, you know, on most of our controllers, we have four channels of RGB LEDs. And so each one of those can handle 64 LEDs. And so for a total of 256. Now, they're broken up in such a way that it's kind of easy. You could run one up to the back box and have maybe 64 LEDs back there. You could maybe run two channels onto the play field, uh, maybe use some for GI, some for all of your inserts. And then you still might have a few cabinet lights, maybe on the front, some flashing start button or whatever else. So we made it kind of convenient, but you can see it also is, is kind of like a little interesting configuration because with the board mounted in the back box, some of your cabinet wiring is, is you know, it's there's going to be some strands going there, but then getting to the play field is a little different because if we have two channels of the RGBs going to the play field, we now have two cables we're going to have to unplug each time for that. So, you know, probably keeping it as central is, is best. Like, you know, the play field, it, there would be maybe two branches if you went down, like, like all of the LEDs in here would be very close to where 
uh, and unfortunately I'm showing a driver board instead of, do you have the CPU board there somewhere, Chris? Okay. So here's the actual uh, controller board. That's, and that, that's the main board that is um, talking to the computer. That, that, that's the USB to, to actually sort of receive all the commands from the host computer, and this is driving the whole fast network. Correct, and then the fast, all of the driver boards plug into the RJ45s here. And here you can see the four common connectors that go to each of the uh, RGB channels. And um, each one of these is, has a polyfuse on it, so if a particular channel shorts out, it's not going to affect the other channels. What is so a polyfuse? Gonna... That sounds cool. Yeah, polyfuse is a device that um, when, instead of blowing and having to be replaced, it heats up and it goes high in pins, which means basically the power got dropped to next to nothing in there. It only keeps consuming enough power to keep itself in this heated state to where it goes very high in pins. So it's like the LEDs have almost no power going to them whatsoever. But now when you remove the short, it's like now that will heal itself and it will become solid again, be a nice, a nice fuse. So it's kind of like a little automatic circuit breaker. Ab absolutely. Yep, good way to describe it. So now you can kind of see with these four connectors here, if I have two of the, and you can see all of the uh, RGB LEDs kind of going um, to all the various points. I don't know right now where Chris has the beginning of this. If I found one, I could try to plug it in, but um, let's see. Here's, here's a long enough one. So, so anyway, this, this connector right here, a, a little three pin connector, we just have power, ground, and data going on. But you can see, like, once I plug that on there, it's like if I have two of those channels going on the board, it's very very clean. There's, like, no long wires on this. The only long ones now would be going up into the back box or if you want to put some stuff, you know, down in the cabinet as well. So, you know, I think most of the time it's if you have the room. This is a very small controller here. If you have the room, it probably is best to mount it on the play field. Okay, so just uh, the, the takeaways of this conversation are... Um, if you put your driver boards, your switchboards, distribute them out near the things they're controlling. Uh, and then the second thing, um, your long bundles, you keep your wires as short as possible in general, and yeah. your long bundles of wires, you don't want to run high powered wires sort of al alongside, like, I don't know what these wires are, but you, you, you wouldn't want to have like LED control wires and switch wires running alongside high power wires because they could cause interference. Correct, yes, yeah. Keep them as far away as possible. It's okay to cross, you know, anytime you do uh, some 90 degree angles across or whatever else, it's absolutely fine. But whenever you have like uh, low power wire switches or, you know, LEDs, whatever, whatever a digital signal is running with the high power signals, that's not a good idea. All right, Dave Beecher, Harbor Engineer, Fast Pinball. Thank you so much for the time today. Yeah, thank you.